Good afternoon and welcome to the third Goldberg Lecture on Teaching, sponsored by the Department of History here at Ohio State University. My name is Peter Hahn. I'm currently serving as chair of the History Department, and it's my genuine pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to campus this afternoon. The purpose of the Goldberg Lecture Series is to provide a forum that advances discussion about the importance of effective teaching to the health and vigor of Ohio's system of higher education. We are confident that today's distinguished speaker, Speaker of the Ohio House, William G. Batchelder, will deliver an insightful lecture. In a moment, the president of Ohio State University, Dr. E. Gordon Gee, will formally introduce our speaker. First, let me share briefly that the lecture series is named in honor of Professor Harvey Goldberg, a legendary professor of history who taught here from 1950 to 1962, and who not only educated his students, but inspired them. More than a decade ago, a group of Harvey students memorialized him <coughs> with a foundational gift that enabled us to establish the Harvey Goldberg Center for Excellence in Teaching. Under the leadership of its very capable director, Dr. David Staley, that center has emerged as the cornerstone of the History Department's <coughs> initiatives to promote innovative and effective teaching, not only in the department, but across the university and increasingly across Ohio and beyond. If anyone is interested in learning more about the Goldberg Center and its many missions, I encourage you to contact Dr. Staley or me at any time. And now I'm privileged to call forward a man who needs no introduction, President E. Gordon Gee. I'm delighted to be here today, and truly delighted to be here. And uh, I was joking with our speaker uh, a few minutes ago that out in front there were a number of drums and cymbals going on. And, uh, <laughs> Here greeting him, but they they came, to wrong, <laughs> they came to the wrong place, Bill. So I'm not I'm not having that happen. But uh, Peter, thanks to you and your colleagues in history. Thanks for the leadership, David Staley, all who are making such an enormous difference, and and truly are. And this is a remarkable gift uh, on behalf of those who uh, loved um, Dr. Goldberg um, and the opportunity for for his legacy to continue to live through what we're doing. Um, of course, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon to. Uh, to introduce our guest of honor, uh, honor quite uh, candidly, and he knows this because I've written him notes about this, I am the uh, president of the uh, Bill Batchelder Fan Club. Um, and I say that with great affection. Bill and I have known each other for 22 years. One of the first people I met when I came to Ohio, and, um, and we re remain strong and avid friends, and, uh, and uh, I really appreciate that friendship, though. I just wanted to be, uh, be here to be able to say that. Um, but of course, uh, the speaker has had a long um, and distinguished career. He's a loyal member of our ardent alumni. Uh, speaker Batchelder earned his Juris Doctor from Ohio State in 1967. Since leaving the university, the speaker has established a long and uh, distinguished career in practicing and teaching law. And he does both uh, very, very well, I can assure you. He spent 31 years at Williams and Batchelder Law Firm in his hometown of Medina, Ohio. During that time, he taught at the University of Akron Law School and Cleveland State University. And of course, he is known for his strong hand and steady compass in leading uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, and I say that because of the fact that uh, it's amazing for me, one who observes the political scene from a bit of a far, but very closely also, uh, how adroitly he has managed the political waters that we've been dealing with. Um, his first tenure in the General Assembly lasted 30 years. 30 years. That is amazing. <laughs> Before he traded legisla legislation for a gavel, I will say. He then served on the bench for the Medina County Court of Common Pleas and the 9th District Ohio uh, Court of Common Pleas. Um, I will just note on the side that, um, that uh, both the speaker and his wife, uh, if, you, if you say hello, judge, they both turn because uh, <laughs> his wife, uh, Alice, is the, uh, is the distinguished leader of the Sixth Circuit. She is the chief judge of the United States Senate. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, um, a very distinguished role that she is playing also. Uh, Representative Batchelder returned to the Ohio House in 2007 and is currently in his third consecutive term. Upon his re-election in 2010, Bill Batchelder was elected Speaker of, uh, of the House by his colleagues. And clearly, Speaker Batchelder brings a unique perspective to education in Ohio, having spent time both in the classroom and the State House. <coughs> Now, I would be remiss if I did not note that the speaker is wholly supportive of this university. We have no greater friend in uh, the legislature than 
Bill Batchelder. And from his seat in the General Assembly, he's done remarkable things in support of education in general. He was critical of some of the university's most important successes in the State House. I will note that uh, he was critical to two that just occurred this past uh, this past year, year and a half. First uh, was the uh, eliminating of the burdens of construction regulations, construction reform. Bill was the coalition builder to make that happen. Uh, without him, that would not have happened. And then the second, which I think is has differentiated Ohio from almost any other state in the country is that partnership between business industry and universities called the Third Frontier Program. Enormously successful, continue to be so. So much of the support from within this, in the State House uh, for these two initiatives is thanks to uh, Speaker Batchelder. So now I fully understand that no one is here to see me, so I'll invite the man to the hour on the stage. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome my friend, um, the Speaker of the House of Representatives of the State of Ohio, Bill Batchelder. very much uh, appreciate that. Uh, Gordon Gee and I have been friends, as he said, for 22 years, and uh, during some of that time, he was AWOL from the Ohio State campus. Uh, and one thing he did, he, he went out to the East Coast, which has always been mysterious to me, but uh, but he came back, and that's what counts. It, it, it's, it's not, uh, it, it wasn't a, ter a terminal uh, departure from this wonderful campus and this outstanding research university and I think sometimes people don't realize the breadth of the, the knowledge that people all over the world have of this university. It is an outstanding university and perhaps uh, even more important than being an outstanding university it has an outstanding impact on those who have the privilege of going here uh, to undergrad, graduate school, to participate in the many programs that are here. I'm always pleased and honored. It's fun when you're somewhere and you see someone go by with a, a little O on their hat or whatever, and, and you say to them, oh, uh, did you go to, every song you run into somebody from Oklahoma, I don't know why there are a lot of <laughs> O's on their hats, but, but uh, by and large, <laughs> that is an emblem of this great university. One of the things that I appreciate about this university the most is the effort that Gordon Gee has made to bring people together to support the university. And it's wonderful when you're trying to get something done in the General Assembly to have such an enthusiastic participant in the process as, as Dr. Gee has always been. That is a very, very important thing, which I think uh, sometimes is underestimated by those who are in the business of uh, picking uh, presidents for state universities, uh, whatever university that might be. That is that there has to be that interaction so that people are aware of the importance of the university, particularly now that we are looking for more and more cooperation with business and industry. That leader has to have the leading capacity to bring people on board for those programs. So we're just, I know how our caucus feels about you, Gordon. And, and you are one who has uh, touched many of their lives. You have uh, been a help to them whenever they have asked. And perhaps most important, you are one who encourages their faith and confidence in the Ohio State University. And we thank you for that. It's an honor for me to be here today. Uh, I have uh, two children. Uh, one of them uh, doesn't know any history. Uh, she went to uh, St. John's in Annapolis, and all they do is read about 400 of the great books. Now, she did get Herodotus, Thucydides, and so forth along the way, but it wasn't well organized. Thucydides doesn't have the right base, and so forth. So it was a, an unusual uh, uh, process. She then went off to law school. And my son had the privilege of attending here, and it was a privilege uh, because uh, his uh, opportunity was to study in one of the best history departments in, in, in the country. Uh, Joe Lynch was his original advisor and uh, really was a wonderful man and a great influence on him. Um, he went through an interesting uh, cycle. He had uh, three different uh, topics. And the first one was uh, someone else had taken it up and, and they found that out. And then interestingly enough, the next one was a study of a, of a he, my son is a medieval historian, 
there's a lot of demand for that. And, uh, as, a, <laughs> as, as a result, uh, um, you know, you wouldn't think anybody else would be looking at anything that you're looking at, but that didn't prove to be the case. The next thing was this weird medieval monk who was, um, who thought the devil was somewhere in the monastery and it was up to him to sort of drive him out and so on. And uh, one day, uh, unfortunately, his advisor came in and said, Bill, I have bad news. Uh, a lady is working on your abbot. And he said, really? Where? Well, she, mind you, a lady, she is in Tel Aviv. That seems strange somehow, that there would be someone working on an abbot in Tel Aviv, but in any case, that let him go on to his third subject, uh, where he completed his uh, PhD at this institution. He studied, um, he had a couple of masters. He had one from uh, St. Andrews in Scotland, which uh, was also fascinating. Gave him an opportunity to participate politically in uh, one of the uh, Scottish parties, the Scottish Nationalist Party, which was dedicated to freeing Scotland from England's totalitarian grip on the, I think mostly on the oil world. Uh, <laughs> this is a fascinating experience for me because uh, I have had uh, probably some of the finest history <clears throat> teachers that one could have in terms of inspiring me to love history and to study history. The teaching of history is something that is given to people like Professor Goldberg, who inspire young people to love history. I had a wonderful professor up at uh, Ohio Wesleyan, where I went undergraduate, and uh, this particular uh, history professor was excitable, I think it's fair to say, and he also, when he got excited, had a strange pronunciation of things, and he used to say, during lectures, and you must love your history. And uh, and then he would also, because he wanted to, he had a choice between going on and getting his PhD and going into organized baseball. And so periodically, when he was lecturing, he would drop into a hitter's position and he would say things like, uh, and so then the crowd was quiet and you know, and so forth, as you can imagine. <laughs> history inspires, I think, young people, and properly so, and it also, through the teaching of history, well done, young people advance intellectually. They advance in terms of perspective. I don't recall offhand, I think it was Santayana who said that uh, often we don't learn anything from history, unless, of course, we repeat it, and then that brings it all back. I think that's something we have done poorly at recent history uh, down in Washington. It's uh, discouraging uh, to see what I have seen in uh, my brief life uh, <laughs> going on in regard to interaction among members of legislative bodies, which are, which are very, very important. We are at this point in time, I, I want to mention this uh, because there may be many volunteers here, we are right now starting up the Ohio Constitutional Modernization Commission. And in the 1970s, we had a, a study, the Ohio uh, Constitutional Revision Commission, which brought back to us, I think, 47 different recommendations, and uh, we adopted uh, all of those, uh, less uh, three, like 44 were adopted. And um, it, was a, it was an exciting time to go back and look at what might have happened had there been a constitutional uh, convention instead. The progressives in Ohio uh, perceived the need for constant review of the Constitution, and so they, in the 1912 Constitution, put, put in a provision that required that the question of whether there should be a constitutional uh, convention be asked of the people every 20 years. And uh, so it has been, and, and uh, uh, fortunately, uh, I don't see too many Madisons around. Fortunately, uh, we have uh, not had a lot of those, but uh, that con that particular convention was a very, very significant change in Ohio's government. It was the height of the progressive era and reflected those things. But we're going to go back over the Constitution again. That particular group, I think, took eight years 
to uh, do their work. And so it is that uh, we will be working at that directly. And it's the kind of thing that obviously has an impact, but more importantly, provides hope and an opportunity to look at things that have not been thought about or have been thought about in a way that uh, is, is uh, negative, people looking for some kind of a change uh, in what goes on in the Constitution. Although as long as Chairman Redford is over at the Democratic headquarters, I think we will have plenty of initiatives and referenda uh, to amuse ourselves <laughs> in the coming years. <laughs> I'm pleased to see my friend Nikki Schwartz here for many years we've been friends, and I don't think we agree politically on too many things, but I have, uh, I, I watched a very big crisis in Ohio that he managed to solve, in my opinion, and that was a prison riot where one guard was murdered, many people were injured, uh, it was a very, very tough situation, and he walked into that as a, exemplifying the best people in the bar and managed to work out a settlement of that which uh, really came amazingly well and uh, you are certainly to be congratulated for that. Most lawyers don't get to do anything like that in a lifetime, nor do they have the skill, I might say, to do what you did. It's an honor for me to be here with you today and to be speaking at this uh, Harvey Goldberg Center for Excellence in Teaching. In my many years in the Ohio House, I have always valued institutions of higher education and learning. And as, alumnus, as an alumni of this institution, Ohio State in particular, and our colleges and universities are one of the state's chief strengths, and especially in these difficult <coughs> times. Sometimes I think we forget how many universities we have, private and public. It is for this reason that during the terrible budget crisis of the last few years, the crisis in which we were forced to close an $8 billion hole in the state budget, which was 17% of the total budget. In that situation, we were able to, in a period of four months, with help from some faculty from here, as well as some people who had a lot of insight into our state budgeting, we were able to work with President Gee, uh, in particular, and to shield this university from some of the most serious and severe of these potential cuts. And I want to thank him today for the way he approached that. It was obvious that we didn't have enough money. That was clear. It was equally obvious, in my opinion, that in this circumstance, it was important that we be very careful about not putting Ohio in a less favorable position to attract business and industry and create jobs. And so it was that we had to do that without increasing taxes. <clears throat> During that deliberation, we were able to implement several changes to Ohio law that will greatly benefit Ohio's institutions of higher learning and Ohio State in particular. Over the last several years, Ohio has been losing some of its best and brightest high school graduates to out-of-state colleges and universities. And to help reverse this, uh, reverse this trend, the General Assembly accepted an amendment that would give in-state tuition to Ohio high school graduates who return to Ohio for college regardless of their current residency. And this was obviously then denominated in order to have a slogan type title for it, Buckeyes Forever. Well, that's good. That's a good thing to say. <laughs> Encouraging high school uh, students and graduates to return to Ohio uh, for college to prepare for their long run career is paramount to the long term consistency of their residency and their participation in Ohio education, but more than that, in Ohio business industry, whatever they choose to go into. During this budget, we also authorized a $75,000 per year grant uh, to the co-op internship program and, and the Glenn School at this university uh, is a part of that. Those, those uh, programs have been cut earlier. In addition, the General Assembly allowed students attending schools in-state to be el eligible for the Ohio College Opportunity Grant and increased the grant for that program by $8 million a year. And this again in the face of, of cuts. 
As Ohio and the rest of the world have moved further into the digital age, the incorporation of technology into our schools and universities has become of paramount importance. And I managed to have avoided all of that education <laughs> and information by computer, my cell phone. The utilization of these new technologies has allowed students to be educated in ways that were never possible before. These new technologies also provide opportunities to save students money by digitizing textbooks and making them available for download. That's a phrase I've never been comfortable with. To help further these developments, the budget requires the Chancellor of Higher Ed to create a pilot program for distribution and use of those digital textbooks. Perhaps the most significant economic change that was made during this most recent budget was the ability of colleges and universities to move away from the multiple prime contracting system for construction of public improvements. Although universities and other public institutions may still use that system, if that is their desire, if they choose that, having the flexibility to choose the alternative method which was first provided in this year's budget, uh, that method for bidding contracts to university construction will help universities save substantial costs and allow more money to be put into the classroom. These reforms and changes would not have been possible without the input and support from Ohio's colleges and universities, Ohio State in particular. President Gee rightly noted that the education and research occurring here at the Ohio State University are the catalyst for the state's long-term growth and leadership in the global economy. It is with these thoughts in mind that we set out to work on the biennial budget. I do not need to tell the faculty of one of Ohio's, pardon me, one of America's premier research institutions about the value of academic research. Ohio State's history department has strengths in everything from ancient Roman to Latin America to military, women's history, and so forth. I'm familiar with the strengths of this department, not only from its reputation and position within Ohio's premier research institutions, but also from personal experience. I was very, very proud that my son was selected uh, as one who uh, was recognized for his teaching in the classroom. And uh, that, that really, that was a thrill for me to see him in that position. He loved teaching. He used to have the young people come around and uh, there was a cap on how many people you were supposed to have in your classes. But there would be some who would show up uh, and they would say, I can't graduate without a class. And he would be uh, pleased to take them on as extra students. That was permitted by the uh, faculty, which I think saw the problem that some of the young people had economically and so forth. And uh, he, he really loved that. Dr. Uh, Lynch and uh, Dr. Hannawalt uh, particularly had an influence uh, on his life, although there were a number of other teachers, uh, some of the senior scholars who were willing to continue teaching in the introductory classes particularly had, had an impact on him. Uh, Dr. Lynch was one of those, uh, Dr. Rosenstein. And, and so it was that uh, he found a home here at Ohio State. And he found a home in the sense that these were faculty who wanted to inspire in the students that they were working with the desire to be student and teaching oriented, as well as research. We all understand the value of research. But many, many young people have their lives changed by teaching people in these universities. It's a great opportunity for them to have their whole lives and goals reoriented by faculty members who are true teachers. And I think that that's something that sometimes is forgotten. The presence of the Goldberg Center at a history department distinguished for research speaks very favorably of this department and the university's dedication to teaching. I understand from reading a biography of Dr. Goldberg that this was a man who believed in teaching. Not only believed in it, but did it so well that they had to have extraordinarily large classrooms <laughs> so that he might indeed be heard by the many, many students who wanted to hear. What a tribute to a man to have taught in a context in which 
they had to grant extra room for him to do that work which he did so well. I can recall up at Ohio West they had the Dr. Ben Spencer who taught Shakespeare and often had people sitting on the windows at Great Chapel and uh, because there were no seats. <coughs> I never quite understood why anybody wanted to sit in those window ledges. Uh, it was a long way down and uh, after all, <laughs> obviously he inspired people because uh, nobody fell out the window. The, um, I, I think that kind of recognition that this history the faculty has given to him and to his work is a reflection of how important that is to this university. A lot of universities emphasize to the exclusion in some cases of teaching, have recognized research. But here is a marvelous program which recognizes that wonderful research opportunity, pardon me, the wonderful teaching opportunities that you can have with faculty who are oriented uh, toward it. And this dedication to teaching is an important commitment which demonstrates not just concern for students, but also an understanding that our taxpayers in the state of Ohio lend their considerable support to this institution because they do believe in the research that's conducted, the techniques developed, and the new knowledge will greatly benefit Ohio's young people in the seminars and in the lecture halls, as well as in their writings and so forth. Teaching is the medium through which this research is transmitted to these young people, and that is why teaching is of the first importance. I have some knowledge of the challenge of classroom teaching. I had been an adjunct professor at, uh, at law at Akron University. That was a very fascinating experience uh, to me. Uh, I uh, taught naturally legislation. And uh, as a result of that, I had the opportunity to interact with students of two kinds. I taught from four to six. That meant that I had day students and I had night students. And the night students were particularly inspirational because many of them were making huge sacrifices, not just of time and study and so forth, but sacrifices financial and, and, and not being advanced in their jobs because while they were there, it was a very demanding study. Uh, I also taught at the uh, Cleveland State University Levin College of uh, Urban Affairs. That was exciting. Uh, that was a Saturday class, and I taught from 9 to noon and from 1 to 4. And it was a real benefit for the students because that meant that they could not take two classes later on. They cleaned things up on a Saturday. And unfortunately for those students, I was unleashed on them along with Patrick Sweeney, one of my dear friends from the city of Cleveland. And uh, I'm not sure what measure the uh, students took of uh, the General Assembly of the State of Ohio by having the two of us show up. But uh, Pat, Pat and I, of course, uh, have been good friends since we started there uh, back in the 60s. And the, one of the beautiful things about it was that we had some cross-section, as you can imagine, with a Saturday class from 9 to noon and 1 to 4. That, uh, that class, I remember one uh, particular student uh, who was uh, uh, Nigerian, and um, he was fascinated because I knew the different tribes of Nigeria. Well, that just shows uh, I sort of have a, a, a lot of stuff in my head, most of which is totally unusable. But uh, in his case, it meant something to him, and, and uh, he was there working on his uh, PhD. The, uh, those lectures also were interesting because the students totally interacted with us. That is to say, um, they were allowed to interrupt whatever we were doing and ask questions because uh, a lot of times, uh, I'm sure Pat and I, uh, you know, showed less light than a firefly at noon. And uh, therefore, it was important that they have the opportunity to interrupt, uh, put a flag on the play, as it were. I have learned to put together topical lectures. I have experienced the difficult challenge of teaching students Socratically. And I love that. Uh, the Socratic method is uh, one that we all use in law school. And uh, it's, uh, I think, a, a very fascinating way to have people contemporaneously thinking uh, in, in a classroom and, and answering questions. One of the other things that I enjoyed was working uh, with uh, various uh, 
documents. Uh, I think that the teaching through the use of documents as a teacher is, is a very important part of our educational system. Uh, I particularly like to use the Federalist Papers. Uh, Patrick said that that was just an effort by the landed gentry to uh, change the constitution of the country, and, uh, and uh, obviously I didn't think so, but uh, after all, that was his point of view. The, uh, the opportunity to teach young people is, is an opportunity that, very frankly, has its own rewards way beyond. I, I admire faculty members because they, first of all, have to take so much time to prepare and all these things, but in addition, what they do to inspire young people to want to go out of the classroom and do that kind of work themselves. That, that is, is a beautiful gift that uh, good faculty have. I never had the opportunity to supervise graduate student research, but um, one of the, my best memories is, uh, of undergraduate study at Ohio Wesson as a history major was my senior research project. And uh, I'd had the opportunity to work with William Randolph Jones, who needless to say was from the South. And he held bachelor's, master's, and a PhD from Harvard. Now, that was uh, fairly unusual. And who, by the way, went on his career to the University of New Hampshire. They offered him the opportunity to oversee the acquisition of the new history library. Uh, Professor Jones took the post immediately, and I asked him if it was better compensated. He had no idea what they were he was getting to go to New Hampshire and build a library. He was on his way. Uh, Dr. Jones allowed me to do a historiographical uh, project to, to the, the historiography of cyclical history. Uh, and it was, a, to me, it was a great opportunity. We, we did uh, uh, Hegel, Toynbee, and Oswald Spengler. I'll never forget Oswald Spengler. He's probably the least red man in America today, but uh, at, at, at one time he was a, the focus of uh, uh, a great theory about the nature of historical motion. And he was speaking really about a lot of uh, uh, things which uh, were fascinating as far as I was concerned. Uh, I don't think anyone reads Spengler anymore. I'm probably the last guy that ever read Spengler. <laughs> At least that was what my professor said. He, uh, he said to me, uh, do you think if he had never written anything that the world would be poorer? And I said, uh, oh, indeed I do. He said, I don't think so. <laughs> there, there, there's nothing like being given the opportunity to study something and then have the professor tell you that uh, having worked your way through it, it probably wasn't very worthwhile. The... Uh, the emphasis that faculty provide when they serve as advisors to you individually, almost tutorially, I think is one of the outstanding teaching things that particularly history professors can do. And uh, I think that, as I understand this department, that's something that has a great deal of emphasis. Uh, and I think that that is very important. When I uh, said to my son, uh, he's out in Philadelphia, he, uh, he's had an interesting experience. You know, you can have a lot of PhDs, but if you don't take a year of education in the uh, vocational department of education, uh, then you can't teach in schools unless you're teaching at the college level. I have a brother who did that. He went through Kenyon, Phi Beta Kappa, then he taught for a few years, and then they told him he couldn't teach anymore because he didn't have any education <laughs> courses in <of> preparation. <coughs> this is a great country. <laughs> Today, from a broad hill, he writes textbooks used all over the United States and Canada, and, but he can't not teach a class. Sometimes there is a, a mystery about education that makes you wonder. In any case, uh, he helpfully suggested that um, I really ought to talk a little bit about decades of experience in the Ohio General Assembly because I'm an original source. <laughs> I never thought of myself that way. A lot of people have told me I was different things, but an original source, that was new. And he said I could particularly bear down on the subject of 
that I was probably <coughs> the best prepared for, and that was my work on the Northwest Ordinances. And <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that was a little bit before my time. I, I, I would have to, to confess to that. But I have been there in six different, uh, uh, I was there in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and the zeros and now. That's a lot of stuff, I think. And uh, uh, my wife it was very upset the other day. She was introduced as an outstanding judge for decades at the Heritage Foundation. And she said, God, that made me sound old. But Ed Meese had said it, so you had to rely on the former Attorney General after all. But uh, uh, I, I actually started out uh, long before her and, and, I'm, and had the privilege of coming back to it. I'd like to talk a little bit about a subject that I do know something about, that I feel comfortable with, and that I would like to share a little bit with historians because, in my opinion, the Ohio General Assembly, and particularly the Upper House, the House of Representatives, has a very, very <laughs> fascinating, <laughs> a very, very fascinating uh, history, and it is one that I had the privilege of watching go through two revolutions. And ordinarily, revolutions don't turn out well. <clears throat> but take the Russian one, for example, or Napoleon. Or it's, a, it's a tough business. We were very fortunate we had the sort of leaders that we had in, in our revolution. In 1967, I had the privilege of going to work for John W. Brown, who was the Lieutenant Governor of Ohio for many years, a dear friend, and who let me work with him go onto the floor with him. I sat beside him in the chaplain's seat uh, where he presided over the house, and he was a great parliamentarian. Not good, he was great. And uh, in that time, I was able to uh, really spend a whole session there. Back then, the sessions were not uh, uh, particularly long, and they were not uh, actually uh, annual. They made a change and uh, changed them to annual. but. We had come in Ohio to a series of Supreme Court decisions which uh, changed the legislative bodies dramatically. The decisions were one man, one vote. Did you ever notice how sexist that phrase is? I often wondered why liberals use that phrase. <laughs> the uh, the uh, decision was handed down in 1964 in Olin versus Rhodes, and as a result of that decision, uh, we had to change the structure of our assembly. That's a very dramatic thing to do. Uh, under the Hanna Amendment, every county had had a, um, a, a house member. And that meant that Noble County, with 10,000 people, had a house member. And another county with 100,000 people would have a house member. But uh, the large counties had, <clears throat> for every 100,000, had a, a house member. So then Cuyahoga County, for example, had 18 House members. And they were selected on a remarkable pro program called uh, the Bedsheet Ballot. And what it was was a list of 18 Republican candidates and 18 Democrat candidates, and then someone who might manage to get enough signatures as, as an independent. So the Republicans traditionally in Cuyahoga County would have one member, uh, uh, Bill Taft, and the other 17 members of the delegation would be folks who were of the other faith. And uh, that uh, suddenly was changed by this decision. All of a sudden, individual subdivisions drawn into a district had a member. One member for Parma, for example. And then a group of uh, Westlake, uh, Bay Village, Rocky River, in the aggregate had one member. Now the people actually could know the person they were voting for, for example. It was a remarkable change, and it meant that big city bosses no longer had much of an impact because people in Bay Village really didn't care what the guys downtown, as they referred to, thought. And it was a dramatic change because when this happened all at once, a whole drove of new people came in. Inexperienced people like George Winovich, who'd never been elected, I think, before, for example. Uh, people like Pat Sweeney, who uh, had not been elected to anything before. They all of a sudden constituted the House, and a new dynamism was set loose, which uh, was very creative. 
And the results of it were that uh, people were paying a lot more attention to what was going on in the General Assembly, and a lot of changes uh, were made. Now that revolution, uh, in turn, gave rise to other revolutions of, through local government and so forth, as people in the General Assembly changed things, which uh, were dramatic changes in their impact. The uh, Senate previously had had some dual districts. Uh, that was sort of a fascinating thing where you had two, uh, dis uh, two Senate districts that overlay each other. And that way you could put a bunch of rural counties in with an urban county, and then the rural districts always elected the senator. It was a, a process that was sort of fascinating uh, in terms of its implications. Well, obviously, uh, that was changed as well. So now you had a whole new structure within the General Assembly, but it was, uh, it was a structure that was much more productive in terms of, of the creativity of it. The, uh, the, that revolution resulted in changes also for higher education, and significant changes. <clears throat> it was a situation in which uh, all of a sudden there was a focus on higher education that had not existed before. When I worked for John Brown, out of the constitutional officers, two had been to college. The others, the governor, Jim Rhodes, the lieutenant governor, the uh, auditor, you know, Roger Clark, they had not been to college. Is that a bad thing? No, they were all the sons of the Depression. They didn't have the opportunity that most people have today to go to college. And consequently, they rose up through the political system and uh, were people who had real leadership skills and abilities, but not necessarily academic. I can remember saying to Governor Rose one time after we had a meeting with some bond lawyers, <laughs> he thought bond lawyers were geniuses. And uh, I said, they're fine people, of course, and very outstanding, but uh, <laughs> I used to say to him, Governor, You've got more common sense about what we have to do with bond issues than the bond lawyers. Be guided by that, and then they'll do the technical aspect of it. Uh, because he, he, he was overcome by that sort of thing. The nature of the legislature also changed because the emphasis on agriculture <coughs> was much diminished. When I first went down, there were still a half a dozen or ten people who felt that they were part of the cornstalk brigade. At one time, they dominated the General Assembly. We'd have a person down there for 10, 12, 15 years uh, who was chairman of the same committee time after time. And, but the Cornstock Brigade represented all the rural areas in the state of Ohio. And that was a, a group of people who, in many cases, were actually very outstanding. But they came from uh, parts of the state which were not acquainted with urban affairs. And some of the things that really required insight if we were going to legislate in an adequate and intelligent way. We, uh, at that point in time then, uh, saw just a total change in the leadership. Now more urban, uh, more from areas that uh, expected their people to have at least a college degree and perhaps uh, some postgraduate work. And uh, that was, became a qualification, which it wouldn't necessarily have been in an agricultural district. I can well remember the, the uh, Cornstock members who used to kind of look back to those golden days when they had dominated the assembly. One of them who was a dear friend of mine was from Crawford County and uh, Carpenter and his father both had been dominating kind of legislators. I can recall poor Roger Tracy, whose name may be familiar to you, there were three generations of Tracys who ran the auditor's office. It was just a fight between them and the Fergusons. It was an ongoing feud for generations. And uh, in any case, uh, Roger had a bill to require uh, that people have uh, registration in order to vote. This uh, seemed to city people to be pretty elementary. But to rural people, it was kind of an insult. They knew everybody who lived in their township. What was this about anyway? And uh, I'll never forget uh, Representative Carpenter getting up and saying, that, you know, this wasn't needed, it was unnecessary, and so forth. And then he said, I can recall a time, as my father could, when this house was dominated by the rural people. That was called the Cornstock Brigade, 
And tonight I want to ask that one last time the rustle of corn stalks be heard in this chamber. <laughs> and sat down, looking woeful. Whereupon they beat the heck out of Rogers' bill. <laughs> Most of those people had registration in their own counties, but the, uh, he, he'd struck a note. He'd, he'd struck a chord. We uh, uh, then, uh, uh, briefly, uh, I go over, go over this part. Uh, we had a situation in uh, 1971 where an income tax that had been fought for for years and years and opposed for years and years. And, and um, the upshot of that adoption was that the finances of the state of Ohio changed dramatically. When I first went down, I think the budget was $2 billion. Of course, this last year, it was $128 billion. That's a sizable adjustment. And uh, this was the beginning of that. This was the turnaround when the, uh, the income tax was adopted. Well, I remained there until there was another revolution. It's called term limits. And under term limits, as soon as you've mastered the material and know what you're doing, you go home. It's a remarkable theory, and uh, <laughs> the results have been, uh, I think I would say, mixed. But if you've seen two revolutions, you can see that some of them turn out well and some of them not so much. I think it's important as we uh, look at Ohio history that we realize what a sort of a special kind of an accident it is. Can you imagine the original states of this union that came out of the Revolutionary War saying, yes, it's okay with us if you take all of the land to the West from us and make it into new states and welcome them to the union? You know, the criticism of the Articles of Confederation has always been rampant. But just think of that alone. What a tremendous step that was. And it's a historical step, pretty special to this country. Not too many countries, look at India and others, they don't uh, let go of real estate. That's simply not done. And then in addition, Ohio's uh, participation in the, uh, in the original Northwest Ordinance powers and so forth was really cutting edge because we were the first state that operated under those. The, um, and the Northwest Ordinance was very good law. It, it helped our people to come into a state that was capable of entering the Union. Uh, it seems to me that as I have uh, looked at uh, Ohio history over the years and, and had the opportunity to participate uh, to an extent in, in, that cha in those changes, that really we have been blessed to have the kinds of changes that we have had without the sort of problems that some states have. With all due respect to California, I think at this time it would not be a good time to be someone trying to work in that state. And I think it's important for those of us who have had the privilege of being involved in Ohio history in a very small way, my kid, to look back and see what has happened here because of the vision of those who participated in government. It's an honor for me to be here today because my life, uh, my father was a history major, my wife was a history major, my life has been very much involved in the study of history. The value of what this department what this college, what this, this emphasis on teaching has meant to so many, many people all over this world because this is a college that provides leadership and provides teaching to the world is remarkable. It is a great thing that Ohio State has done for many years. And it is my prayer that people never forget the importance of the relationship between academics who love teaching and the students whose lives are forever altered by it. What a great, great blessing you have brought to this state and to the world through the wonderful teachers that you have employed and who have perfected their skills 
in this setting. And it's an honor to think about the gentleman after whom this evening has been named. To think of how he touched people in that short time through the beautiful lessons of being a real teacher. It goes back to the Greeks, to Socrates and onward. And it is, without question, one of the greatest things that people can do for their juniors. And you have done it so well. Thank you. I was uh, in a very early AP program uh, that was uh, run by Kent State, and I went off to Ohio Wesleyan with, I think it was six hours of American history from taking an exam, as you just indicated. And I was never certain about uh, how good it was. I took other American history courses, but uh, uh, I, I always have reservations about you know, how one exam uh, tells all we need to know about someone uh, in order to credit them out of a given course. I understand the rationale that, that, that he and I, uh, incidentally, uh, were two very close people who got the Third Frontier redone. They got it reactivated. It was not going to move, and uh, it was a privilege to work with them. So uh, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I will inspire my finance chairman, who is a, a wonderful person, to take a look at this, and if necessary, we'll hold some hearings. I love to hold hearings. I mean, you know, people don't pay attention to members. Uh, I mean, you know, the General Assembly, who cares? But uh, when you have hearings, why, then the cameras come in. And a good friend of mine, uh, Lou Stokes, his brother Carl, uh, Used to, I, he could tell where the TV lights were on, no matter where he was in the building, I think. And, and he was a very articulate, uh, handsome man. And, and, uh, but in any case, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, I appreciate that suggestion. Yes, sir. Uh, Bobby and I were treated last year to uh, participation in the College of Arts and Sciences Renaissance Weekend, in which we were exposed to five different areas of endeavor in the college, ranging from joint venture with the Royal Shakespeare Company of Stratford, England to promote the better teaching of Shakespeare to school kids, uh, to a neuroscience department with a giant MRI machine that's going to revolutionize uh, the study of brain functions. And the bottom line of all this was you emerged from that experience uh, feeling that the Ohio State University is not only the intellectual future of this state, it's the economic future yes. of this state. Yes. And I wonder to what extent the members of the legislature understand that. It's a mixed thing, uh, really. Uh, obviously, uh, I can tell you who is convinced of it. That's our governor. He bounces around, well, he bounces around the room ordinarily, but he bounces around the room uh, when this matter comes up, uh, and, and he really sees it as a vision. He's a graduate here, but uh, that's not what it's about. It's about, frankly, creating opportunities for people who otherwise uh, would not have them. 
I think uh, most of the members of the General Assembly, in a vague way at least, have an understanding of it. Some of them, with particularity, people who have uh, taught college and so forth. Uh, but you're absolutely right. The economic growth has to come from here. We're not going to be able to have economic growth vis-a-vis -vis China or someone like that in a competition uh, on an economic basis. Uh, their productivity is predicated on much lower wages and a lot of things that we would not want to accept as the price for our people to be competitive. But uh, I, I think there would be a fairly, one of the big problems that we have here in Ohio today is a problem of having people trained for certain jobs. We have, for example, in the uh, uh, generation of electricity by, uh, I always call them windmills, I realize that's uh, something that they don't like much, but uh, uh, they, we have a, a two-year college which is teaching construction uh, of those uh, uh, wind fields and, and what they do. Um, we have at Zane State a program in drilling for uh, it teaches people everything from uh, being uh, on an oil well rig to uh, advanced uh, sorts of things in that area. And of course, they're going to be drilling all up and down the east side of the state. And it may be a way that those folks who have been economically underprivileged will have the opportunity to uh, bring in the, uh, the shale oil and gas. Uh, so there is an understanding, I think, in, in those areas of the kind of help we have. This state has more, and Jim Rhodes used to say, this state has more good things by accident than most people have on purpose. And uh, uh, typical uh, Jim Rhodes maxim. But think of the, of the uh, medical schools in this state compared to other states uh, and how many there are and, and, how, and what their expertise is and the variety of it. People can come here from all over the world. I don't think that King of Saudi Arabia has to go any particular place. He can go where he wants. He can buy the hospital, uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, the Ohio State Medical School in Cincinnati. We, we just have those kinds of uh, opportunities. And, and a lot of that shows sacrifice by people who believed in these higher education institutions and showed commitment by the General Assembly over the years. Uh, but above all else, obviously, it turns on the fact that we have educational institutions like this one that are capable of doing what they have done. Have I talked too long? No, we're right on schedule. Oh, very good. I, I was going to say, usually I get up and tell them to sit up. <laughs> we have a 20 minute rule in the house. <laughs> well, join me in thanking Speaker Matt Thomas.